Welcome, everyone. Pleased to have you here with us today for our 96th episode of This is CDR. This is CDR is an online event series presented by OpenAir to explore the range of CDR solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals OpenAir seeks to advance uh, here in the U.S. at every level of government, as well as in national and subnational jurisdictions globally. My name is Toby Bryce. Uh, I work on policy and market development for OpenAir based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, if you haven't done so already, please say hey in the chat, introduce yourself if you're with your affiliation, if you'd like, and tell us where you're zooming in from, and make sure to direct that message to everyone and not just uh, hosting panelists so everyone can see your message. Quick background on open air, if you're not familiar with us, we are a distributed all volunteer network dedicated to the responsible advancement of CDR. Um, we are a global community. We work together on shared op projects, open source projects that we call missions in the areas of policy, innovation, communications, and activist market development. Uh, here's an example, a slide from our website that sort of illustrates the range of projects we work on, again, in those four kind of areas of focus. Um, you can start your own projects. It's open source, you know, where we plug in, create a network, start new things, um, it, you know, uh, hang on to an existing project. Um, love to have you be a part of what we're doing. My colleague, Mega Raghavan, who's running the chat, uh, will put a link in the chat so that there's a form that you can fill out to join our group and get on our Discord server, which is like Slack and how we organize our projects. And we'd love to have you be a part of what we're doing. Um, one project that's uh, kind of a, a hot button issue for us right now is a state level CDR procurement bill in Massachusetts called S2096. Um, it recently left committee. It's in a really kind of like uh, uh, contingent and pending place. And we could use all the help that we could get in terms of advocacy. So if you are based in Massachusetts um, or have any sort of Massachusetts connection, please reach out to us. We'd love to have you help us um, contact your local representatives and, and ask them to support the bill because it's important policy and it's in a place right now where it has a you know non-zero reasonable chance of advancing and we'd love to see that happen. As always, uh, we want to define our terms before we get started with the program. This is a definition of CDR from a great resource called the CDR Primer. It's also essentially the same definition that the IPCC uses, so we think it's a good one to work with. Um, anthropogenic purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. As always, uh, whenever we talk about CDR, it's really important to clarify, yell, shout from the rooftops up front that CDR is in no way, shape, or form any sort of substitute for rapid uh, and you know as, as complete as possible reduction of greenhouse gas emissions globally. We need to decarbonize the global economy, reduce emissions as much as possible, as quickly as possible, full stop. Um, without that important work, which is 90 plus percent of our climate work, CDR will not be enough. So we need both CDR and emissions reduction. Um, CDR is complementary to emissions reductions. And um, we need CDR to neutralize the emissions that we can't reduce in a climate relevant time frame, so we can reach net zero around mid, mid century, which is what we're targeting. And then in the second half of the century, there will be one to two trillion tons of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere that we will need to start removing to restore our climate to a safer and healthier state. So those are kind of the purposes of CDR. Um, it is not a substitute for uh, rapid decarbonization of the economy, emissions reduction. Um, so we need to be working on both. That's why we're here. The scale of CDR that we need is going to be billions of tons a year by mid-century. We're currently, depending on how you measure it and what you're counting, we're doing tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 tons a year right now. So we have a couple orders of magnitude to leap over the next two decades, and it's really important work, and, and that's what we're here to work on. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mega Raghavan, who is going to talk a little bit about Run of Show and introduce today's speaker, Mega. Hey, everyone. I'm Mega. I'm an Open Air member uh, based in London, and I work on policy and market development as well. Um, so yeah, as usual, some housekeeping notes before we start. We're going to begin with a quick presentation, and that'll be followed by some uh, prepared questions from Toby and then moderated audience Q&A. So please just type any questions you have on the way into the Q&A box. Um, it is separate from the chat box, so please find the right one. Uh, it just helps us to organize things better. Um, the event's being recorded, so we'll send it out to all of you who registered. We'll also send it, uh, put it up on OpenAir's YouTube channel and OpenAir's website. All right, this week we're very pleased to welcome Holocene co-founder and CEO Anka Timofte to present and discuss the company's novel low-temperature duct process, which leverages organic chemistry for scalable and affordable CDR. 
Uh, Anka serves as Holocene CEO, having started Holocene from her Stanford GSB dorm after eight years of experience designing and developing DAC facilities at Climeworks. Originally from Romania, Anka holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering with a minor environmental in Environmental Engineering from Washington University. She also earned a Master of Science in Environmental Energy Engineering uh, from ETH Zurich and completed her research thesis at Stanford University. Uh, she completed a Master of Business Administration from Stanford University, focused on climate technology deployment and climate finance with an emphasis on carbon dioxide removal. Uh, so Anka, whenever you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. A pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Uh, I would say open air and this is CDR is not only a community builder and informing so many of us on, on the CDR space, but I also I recognize it's a historical record of what's been happening in our industry, uh, which has been exploding. So i um, very honored to be part of this and, and also to present Holocene today and our story. So I'll I'll probably cover today um, technology. I'll also talk about our story, um, our plans for scale up, and then I'm very curious in the questions to see you know which parts uh, we want to hear from us more about. A little bit about introduction and context for what we're who we are and what we're doing. So as you've heard in the introduction, well, I myself I'm a chemical engineer by training, was at Climeworks for quite a long time, and. Uh, it was um, such such a journey to be in director capture early days. So around 2012, I had for the first time ever heard about director capture and um, got to participate in in the early days of Climeworks. Um, essentially, worked on material development there, heat recovery concepts, process mostly around solid adsorbents, which I think are are still very uh, useful and very you know uh, important today in developing director capture technologies. Uh, funny enough, I ended up working on a completely different technology at Holocene, but that's how that's how things go. Um, very proud to have you know built the, the team there, and um, also I got to meet one of my co-founders. You see on, the, on this page, Tobias from Switzerland. He was also early days at Climeworks. Uh, we we got to work together and build plants, um, several of them. I think maybe together five or six. Um, Toby moved on to Hitachi Zosen, which is an EPC contractor. He he worked at um, he worked on waste waste recovery, so so burning waste to um, to get energy out of waste, and got to see much bigger projects. And we got to build a Climeworks during our time. So, kind of the next scale up, you know, what projects that are uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars, what what they look like engineering wise. And uh, very lucky that he moved from Switzerland to Knoxville, Tennessee, where we are today to to start this company with me. And the same can be said about Keaton Ross. So he is our, we always call him our business co-founder, but he actually has a nuclear engineering degree as well. So also technical as a completely different um, experience career-wise. So was at McKinsey, um, Evoke, which is a VC fund, and also Patch, which is one of the um, essentially marketplaces for, for what we're buying and for what we're selling. So worked with our customers, worked with our um competitors and and understands the carbon markets really well. So we thought together um, the three musketeers can go ahead and uh, and build a new DAC uh, startup. And um, yeah, I'll cover a little bit why, you know, as, as you'll see the technology presented here, I think you'll understand why we picked this chemistry from Oak Ridge National Lab and um, how it's uh, very different than everything else that's out there, we think, and what the potential for it is. So I know this crowd, uh, this group here, this community is very informed on on climate and um, you know atmospheric CO two concentration. So I don't want to cover too much of the of the things that you already know, but I do find that sometimes in these moments, reflecting back of why what, why are we doing what we're doing and and how important it is. I think I hear less and less about climate change. Uh, I hear more about CDR markets and, and buyers and things like that. But at the end of the day, like the reason we get up in the morning is because we we care um, that CO2 concentrations are so high. And and actually the company name and the story is, is connected to that. So we named uh, our company Holocene. That's because Holocene is the geo geologic age where still living in, although it's slowly getting rebranded to the Anthropocene just because things are changing so quickly. And the Holocene is the last 12,000 years of climate stability. Essentially, this is because CO2 concentrations were, were quite stable. 
we we got to develop um, you know humanity in general we got to do so many things over the last 12,000 years and it was only possible because um, clim climate has been stable and it's very stark so I think this graph over and over seeing it and, and seeing how much CO2 concentrations have increased and also all the instability that um, you know this this brings um, so I know you uh, probably follow these sad statistics as well but um, obviously CO2 concentrations and, and temperature increases worldwide these are the the things that are we're following the most and, and 2023 was not a good year um, and there's been a lot of different types of damage, um, some permanent, some hopefully we recover from on a worldwide scale, weather disasters, wildfires, um, water loss from glaciers. These are just some of the statistics that, you know, we are sobering and I think inspire us to to really build and, and go through all the hard steps that a, um, a hardware based startup entails. So I think this is what motivates us. And I wanted to share some of that inspiration with you today as well. Well, you know, the the business that we're in is, um, you know, we, we want to always give a nod to carbon emission reduction. So always, always, we need to reduce first the emissions that we're producing as a society. And um, not only that, but we have to remove carbon. And I know you've seen this graph over and over. We are talking about 10 gigaton at least CO2 per year. So I think these numbers are unfortunately getting bigger as the carbon emission reductions are actually not as fast as we all hoped. So this is kind of the, the challenge that we're we're facing. And, and the way we think of it, so maybe just for scale and importance, is that we, you know, there's two two big, maybe big fields that are our, our new industry, the carbon management or the carbon removal industry is compared to one is oil and gas and the other one is waste. So we sometimes think of CO2 as waste, um, although there's, I know some uh, disagree with that with that framing. But, you know, these are just orders of magnitude in terms of what we have to, to do as a whole industry. So on the oil and gas side, we know the, the production volumes. Uh, we see the prices um, for, you know, for a gallon of oil, et cetera. So um, and we know that this industry has had a really long time to develop in comparison to what we have to do. So they've had 150 years to to drill wells and and distribute um, fossil fuels, and and we have you know a third of that to essentially remove all the emissions that have been put out in the atmosphere. And then when we compare it to the solid waste industry, this is really about like tonnage of of stuff and materials we have to move. And um, this is also really Im important to keep in mind that we have to grow. Um, this is why we need all the direct air capture startups we have, as well as all the other solutions on the CDR in the CDR space that I know have been covered in this podcast before. It's um, all of all of this is needed because we're talking about such big volumes. Sometimes it's hard to comprehend um, how, how big um, the, the challenge ahead of us is. So this is the kind of the framing. Now, how we're gonna do this, right? This is the problem without getting overwhelmed. Now looking back at uh, what technology is available and what we can do today. And, and I think we've been lucky. There's been several waves of director capture. Um, Climeworks was one of the first, um, you know, building uh, not only technology, but also the marketplace. We've had a kind of a second wave, more electrochemical solutions. And we think we're part of this third wave. And um, we benefit a lot from the fact that um, in the last decade, there's been a lot more research at universities, national labs. Um, you know, the Department of Energy has funded so many more projects in the space that we're very grateful for. So this is where, you know, we're kind of benefiting from all of that work that's been happening on a very fundamental level. Um, and in our case, again, we're um, licensing from Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, they developed a new chemistry. And what's really, without going into all the details about the chemistry, what's really, really appealing about what um, this new chemistry allows is, it allows something that didn't we think didn't exist before um, is a which is a low temperature um, thermochemical regeneration process. So this is on on the y axis what you see here, and then on the x axis is essentially the uh, the fact that it's a you know liquid system versus a solid. So essentially we start with an aqueous so or water based solution um, as I'll show in a bit um, a few more details and. Um, and then we end with a solid that we have to heat, and this heat is only 100 degrees Celsius, so boiling water temperatures, as we like to say, um, mostly because Celsius is European, so I, we uh, need to memorize the Fahrenheit uh, conversions here. But um, 
So this this unique combination of the two features um, is we think it enables a new space. This is where we are, and I show here a comparison to other kinds of chemical, you know, thermochemical systems, electrochemical. I am well aware that there are now more than a hundred director capture systems out there, and I think we don't do it justice necessarily here. But just to you know, from a technology perspective, um, when we compare ourselves with electrochemical, right? Like so, we have. Uh, potentially the the liquid um, part in common, but again we use heat to to get our CO two back out from our materials. And then when we compare ourselves more to existing um, liquid systems like carbon engineering, um, we use much lower temperatures to to get the CO two out. So this is why we're at this intersection of these two really interesting um, you know types of systems. Now to go a little bit more into the details of of what we're actually doing, so. Uh, I figured, you know, since our process is quite different than what's out there, we think it is. Um, I wanted to show these are the, you know, the unit operations go a little bit more in depth into an engineering discussion. So hopefully you'll um, enjoy that. We have four unit operations. This is chemical engineering speak for four different parts of the system that essentially, you know, four different things happen in our uh, plant for us to load and unload the CO2. Um, and we also have two continuous chemical loops that we that are essentially transporting the CO2 through these four unit operations. So I'll go into detail in each, but I wanted you to at least have like one, uh, you know, once the, the the whole picture. So we have CO2 absorption. This is the loading of the carbon dioxide. We have uh, what we call crystallization or solid formation. This is where we essentially go from a liquid phase. So the CO2 is in the liquid, it goes into a solid, and then we separate the liquid in the solid in the third step. Um, the solid now contains the carbon dioxide. The liquid uh, contains our active material, which goes back into the first step. Um, and then we have the solid um, that has to be regenerated. So we have to get the CO2 back out from the solid so we can continue reusing that material. Um, and this is our you know last step here for that um, that you're that's shown. So maybe going one by one, and you know, I'll I'll describe what happens in this in in each unit operation or in each part of the system, as well as like kind of what we're good at, or you know, why what, what our engineering uh, prowess and expertise is, and also how the chemicals play together. In the first step, we have an air uh, liquid contactor. This exactly uh, the name says it all. It contacts air and and our liquid, which is a water based solution containing amino acids. So we bring those in, in together. Um, the carbon dioxide then reacts with the amino acid that we have in the solution, and um, it essentially then gets you know absorbed um, in in that solution. So it's loaded. By the time we send it to the next stage, then uh, you know the the solution has the CO two in it. Uh, what's important here is, as for all director capture solutions. Because we're working with very dilute concentrations from a chemical engineering perspective, so this 420 ppm carbon dioxide, um, we will need to process large amounts of air to, remo to remove significant amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere So, um, in one go. So what that means is we're going to have a lot of resistance. So as we're pushing the air through these structures and we want the air to encounter the liquid, we, we need to make it as pressure drop free as possible or as low pressure drop as possible. Um, so remove resistance as much as we can. And this is where, um, you know, we're building a lot of expertise um, and we are developing contactors through grants, et cetera, um, trying to figure out how to get this uh, this part of the system as efficiently as possible, working as efficiently as possible. So electricity consumption of the system is driven by this. So the more efficient you can bring air in contact with the liquid, the, the better um, everything is. Um, and, and of course, the more efficient this part is, the more you have efficiency or CO2 that you can use for the next step. So this is quite important. In a second step, we take that amino acid solution. So in water, now it has CO2 in it as well. Um, and this is where again, if things get a little interesting or a little more interesting, maybe. Um, so we add a guanidine, which is a, um, a chemical uh, group. Uh, so guanidines are a type of chemicals. They essentially are uh, nitrogen heavy uh, molecules, so carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. And uh, what's what's interesting about this guanidine is that the CO2 prefers to be with the guanidine than with the amino acid. So we have a reaction happening. And, and essentially when the uh, guanidine and, and CO2 meet, they form a solid, so they precipitate out. And um, 
that means that we are able to concentrate all the CO2 that's in solution. We're able to concentrate it into solid. So we've reduced essentially the volume in which the CO2 is present, which is very good for the next step where we have to heat. So um, yeah, this crystallization process is, um, you know, we're we're relying here on on pretty classical traditional chemical engineering, which is what we wanted. We didn't want to have to reinvent the wheel for every single step here. So crystallization um, is is what gives us the solid containing the CO two, and then um, this is now what we're uh, working with in the next in the next step. Um, so maybe to talk about the separation, I do want to say though on the, on this. On this second step, what's also happening as the amino acid passes the carbon dioxide to the guanidine, it essentially becomes free again to capture more CO2. So the idea is in this step, you're also regenerating the amino acid and you can send it back as soon as it's separate from the solid. So the separation from the solid happens here. Um, just one second. So it happens here. And what you'll see here is um, essentially that, you know, we put this mixture, kind of a slurry of solid and liquid um, through a system. Uh, we we use, you know, partially gravity, partially gravity, but also other forces to separate the solid from the liquid. And actually the separation, the better we are able to separate, the drier the solid at the end, the less energy we have to put in the next step to release the carbon dioxide. So the drier it is, the less water we would have to heat, as well as the less amino acid we would have to, you know, in, in that fourth step. Um, and the liquid, as I said, goes back to the absorption unit, so the air liquid contactor. And um, sometimes steps three and four are combined in some, in some systems. Here we show them as separate because we think the performance and the engineering of each is quite important. And things like how we grew the crystals and nucleation and all of that, like all the, all the crystallization parameters that we worked to optimize, this is where these really show, um, you know, they sh it shows how good we've done the crystallization because um, the separation should take place as easily as possible. Mm -hmm. Now to heat the solids, I think heating solids in direct capture, this is something that others are also working on. What I would say is special about our regeneration of the solids here is that we're heating. So we're heating to 100 degrees Celsius. Um, and the other thing is the, the, we don't have structure, so it's not a structured sorbent like it is in, in solid adsorption, where you have kind of a support and then that support is, you know, has active material on it and the CO2 binds with active material. For us, all of it is active material. So this is all, all good uh, guanidine that has interacted with the CO2 one-on-one, uh, -on -one, almost psychometrically. So this is uh, where the carbon dioxide is, is released. We also have some water, so everything we couldn't remove or didn't dry off um, will also come off here, as well as so any water that we have in the crystals will come off. But this is something that we work to, to minimize, and we think we've gotten, um, you know, even on a small batch scale, we we're able to, to get these numbers uh, to be very efficient. And the CO2, I think this is no surprise what happens with it. Once it's dried of water, um, it's compressed, and then our, our goal and our focus application is always... Uh, sequestration of carbon dioxide underground. Well, we also look at utilization possibilities, but um, sequestration, we know that, you know, when we talk about those gigatons of CO2 that have to be removed and stored away, um, it's always about putting the, the CO2 away for good. This will be my only chemistry slide. Uh, I figured there might be some, some people who are interested exactly in the chemistry. I don't show here all the reactions. But I did want to give a nod to chemistry because it is so important for what we're doing. And, and it is this novel chemistry of amino acids paired with guanidines that you know allow us to do everything and to have what I think is a relatively simple process with those four steps. So the amino acid, again, interacts with the carbon dioxide. It essentially, ultimately, after all the reactions take place, it, it, what that gives us is a bicarbonate or even and a carbonate. So it's equilibrium of both in water. At a certain pH, um, and those species are like a, this useful uh, species of CO two that can then react in the second chemical loop, which you see on the right, with the guanidine. So that that's what the amino acid gives us. It's almost like it's not really a catalyst, but it's almost catalytic in the sense that it doesn't get consumed. It's just a carrier of CO two um, for the guanidine to grab and to form the solid and separate it out. So. We, we symbolize the guanidines here with big, so it's bisimino guanidine. So this is where you'll see the, the BIG and the rest is hydrogens and, and oxygens. Um, so there is some water, there is some CO2 in the solid. And essentially when we release, when we heat up the solid, we get back the, the CO2 in the water. So this is matches with what I said uh, before regarding the process.
Good. So maybe in terms of where we are today, you'll you'll think, okay, this is now uh, in diagram form. What what have we built? What have we tested? So this is kind of the part that comes next um, that I'm happy to share with you. So um, I was just telling Toby before we started that this is um, it's a really important month for us. We are um, essentially assembling right now our test facility, what we call our test facility. This is a plant that is outdoors. Um, it has, uh, it will have when it's running 10, it will be removing 10 tons of carbon dioxide a year. So it's pretty big. It's outside of uh, lab scale. It has kind of um, an early version of the process that we're working, you know, all this to optimize and, and, um, and improve. Um, it will, we think it will be technology readiness, uh, readiness level five or six, um, depending on how, you know, how you <laughs> interpret those uh, definitions. And it will have all those four steps that I showed. So it will have absorption, crystallization, liquid solid separation, and, and as well as heating of the solids. Um, and we're, you know, uh, to design this test facility, we had to not only run beaker level uh, experiments, which obviously we've done early days. Well, we've also been building each unit operation on a three to five liter scale. You can imagine something like that um, in the lab, but you know, outside of uh, the fume hood and. All the data that we collected from that, this is what allowed us to develop the test facility, dimension it, uh, buy equipment for all of it, et cetera. So, so we want to see how kind of our data collection, our engineering plays out as we as we scale these plants. And what we're also already thinking about, because this is just engineering timelines are quite long, um, uh, and I think ours are shorter than normal. I'll show a quick a quick um, graph in a second about you know how fast we have to move in terms of scale up and deployment, but still like when you want to build a pilot, which is what we want to do next of around a thousand to two thousand tons of CO two per year, you need to think about where you're going to put it, um, you know footprint, power, what you're going to do with the CO two, um, how you're going to finance it, all of that. So th these are these are things that we've already been working on for the next scale plant, um, and also what's not shown here, but I want to give a nod to is. Because we have these amino acid guanidines, you might have noticed I kept it relatively general. That's because we have actually several versions of both the, you know, different pairs of amino acids and guanidines. We continue to, to do R&D on that level as well, um, develop new guanidines, understand which pair is better. So in between the test and the pilot, we're also working on, uh, you know, the, the materials themselves and, and how, to, how to best, you know, get, get the most CO2 out of them. So maybe going back to the pilot, so that's for 2026, um, it would be already a plant uh, from which we've sold some um, capacity to Frontier. Um, so so some, you know, we'll, we'll take the CO2, store it underground with our partners, and uh, we've been selling, we're pre we've been doing pre-sales of capacity so that, that this helps us build um, the pilot sooner and faster. And past that, we have, you know, the next scale plans, uh, you might see relatively large, you know, like 50x, 10x from, from those numbers. The way we think about our scale up is um, it's essentially we have a traditional chemical engineering process, very uh, common for, for the chemical industry, for example. So we look a lot at what other industries have done before us. Um, and when it comes to scale up, the way we think of it is kind of um, smallest building at the smallest meaningful scale first to de-risk. But then once that's de-risk, we can we can scale up relatively quickly in in size. And I will say here also, I acknowledge that modularity. Um, I know it's a very important concept for a lot of other uh, direct air uh, capture technologies. You know, obviously for us, there will be at some point a module in the sense that. We're going to reach the maximum size of a crystallizer and then we're going to just scale up in number. We're going to buy more crystallizers for our plant. But we we look a lot at the system integration, um, how to use, you know, heat um, in the system. And, and we think in general, like given the how big the plants have to be long term to, you know, to even feel like a classic well, we think scaling up in size and, and looking to see how chemical engineering scales in general. This is, is really important. We don't want to ignore those lessons. So we have at least 100 years of chemical engineering before us, and we, we rely a lot on that. Um, and we rely on suppliers and equipment to, to tell us exactly what the scale will be. So this is kind of how we, we're approaching um, our scale-up philosophy. In terms of speed of scale, so I know people talk a lot about costs when it comes to director capture. Um, that's also very important. Um, energy consumption, super critical as well. Um, I do think though that how fast we build and deploy 
is another um, really important kind of dimension to all of this. And this is something we think uh, we have an advantage on. So again, relying on that all that chemical engineering knowledge that I described, and just understanding now that we do have a lot more forces behind us than you know a, a Climeworks or a Carbon Engineering had early days. So we have more funding from government agencies. We have more investors. We have more sites to put the plants. There's just a lot more momentum, and we know that you know it's our duty to to make benefit of all of that and build as quickly as possible. So you'll see here that in terms of scale up, we are going more aggressively than than what's been done before us in director capture. But again, still reasonable within what's been done in the chemical engineering industry as a whole. Good. Then in terms of who we're doing this with, so obviously we're not uh, we're not all on our own. So we are a team of thirteen right now. Luckily, we have. Chemical engineers, chemists, mechanical engineers, uh, mostly technical staff um, who have been building different kinds of systems, including the rector capture before. So a lot of expertise, crystallization expertise, as we should um, have. That's really important for our process. But we also have an entire ecosystem of partnerships, customers, funders, and different kinds of partners who are helping us, uh, you know, go through that really fast scale up that we that uh, we we want to show. So on the customer side, you know, we have uh, we had done our first sales to Frontier this year, and we're engaging with other buyers, um, looking at you know how to also potentially fund the pilot plan. So this is this is really important. How are we going to get that on the ground? Um, we are lucky to be part of Breakthrough Energy uh, Fellows. So that was a two year program that's. Um, going on until September, a lot of support from that network um, and on also all the funding for the test facility and everything we've done. So uh, on, on that front, so the very important. Um, we were one of the early winners of the X Prize. So we were one of the student teams that won. And it's been very exciting to see uh, X Prize grow so much in, in this time, as well as the U.S. Department of Energy. We have a grant with Oak Ridge National Lab, as well as other awards and partnerships um, that, you know, together, Add up to around $6 million. So we've been uh, lucky and, and fortunate to have all of the support to, to you know, go from grams in the lab to, to what's now going to be 10 tons a year very soon, um, relatively quickly. On the partnership side, we were started out of Stanford um, through a Stanford uh, venture uh, studio, essentially, as well as other incubators at University of Tennessee. So we have this you know, presence in Knoxville and Tennessee that uh, maybe we'll talk more about in the Q&A, but um, very important to us to, to scale and develop. And um, Tennessee, the Tennessee Valley Authority, so the largest public utility in the U.S., is also um, helping us you know, think about siting of the plants, how to build brownfields, like how to build on brownfields, how to get access to power, all of that, like all of these other aspects that I didn't discuss here today, but are critical for DAC deployment. Um, this is where we get our support and, and knowledge from. And that's all I had. Looking forward to the questions. That was great, Anka. Thank you so much. And I compliment you on your very clear um, explanation of your systems and your the different um, categories of process and the, the chemistry there it was super clear. And we'd love to love to learn about those things. Um, can we talk a little bit just to start about so in CDR more generally, we talk a lot about leveraging biology and leveraging natural processes and leveraging natural systems, you know, with bikers processes, you're leveraging photosynthesis for the actual separation of the CO2 from the atmosphere um, and the benefits that you get from doing that. Can you talk a little bit about are there similar types of benefits from leveraging organic chemistry versus physical inorganic chemistry? Like, are there certain benefits you get? Is it, do you get like the same kinds of benefits from leveraging biology from leveraging organic chemistry because you're kind of unique in that approach and love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I feel like we maybe we're a little bit closer to biology, but not that close. And and actually talking to people who work on biological systems, I hear about the complexity of that and how biology sometimes can be quite unpredictable. Um, our chemistry is a little more, it is organic. So when we say organic, we mean carbon, hydrogen, nitrogens, that, that, that's what the materials are made out of. So we're not using calcium or magnesium or other, you know, other systems. So in that sense, we're differentiated. Um, I think the, maybe one advantage to think of is that because it's organic, so it's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, there is no, um, from that perspective, material uh, limitation in, in, in being able to build these materials. So obviously we need to make the chemicals, but we're not limited by, you know, like how much lithium there is in the world, for example, the way batteries are. So. So I think we have that freedom that biology has in the sense that the, the building blocks are out there 
uh, and we just have to put them together. But I wouldn't say we, you know, in any other way, we're similar to a biological system. Thank you. That was that was very helpful. Um, and and in your process, so are the are the is are the chemicals the the amino acid liquid sorbent solvent and the guanidine are those entirely looped, um, or do they get consumed on a, uh, to a certain extent um, as the process iterates? Yeah. So the the whole idea of the process is that these two types of chemicals are just essentially transporters of carbon dioxide, so they should not get consumed in the reactions. The reactions are reversible. Um, we do have to keep the two loops separate. So this, that separation step where I say the, you know, the amino acid stays in the water, the guanidine goes there, like that's very important. We focus there a lot. And we also don't, ex so don't, we don't expect any consumptive chemistry here. Uh, we also don't expect losses to the atmosphere. So for example, I know some people worry about with, with liquid systems, they worry like, you know, is, does the, do the droplets fly away? So this is something that it's, is solved in engineering. Um, so yeah, all the, the chemicals are fully regenerated in the process, or this is how it should be at scale. And if 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 they're not, then something has gone wrong on the way. Got it. Um, and in terms of the other inputs, um, can you talk a little bit about the energy consumption on whatever basis you would like to per ton or per you know whatever unit? Um, do you cons does your process consume water? Um, any other inputs that that you are conscious of and you need to think about? Yeah. So on the energy front, I'll say I'm, I think and this is maybe something I didn't say in our story is that because we've been in direct recapture for so long, we're very reluctant to throw numbers out there. I think there's been promises and, and sometimes they're hard to keep. Um, so the way we think, I'll say, I'll start maybe by saying where energy is consumed and hopefully that also came across as I was explaining the process. So the air liquid contactors, so the absorption, that's where those fans push through, you know, the smallest resistance, but it's still a resistance. Um, so that's where electricity uh, consumption comes from for us. Um, and, you know, in other systems, there's vacuum for us. Vacuum is not necessarily an input that we need. So uh, our desorption process is completely different. Um, so so the, I would say electricity, obviously, outside of pumping fluids around, if we have to, uh, that's where the, the biggest lever is. And um, on the heat side is, you know, how dry the solids are, uh, getting that energy of desorption for the CO2 in the water. So we understand our energy um, consumption very well from that perspective. And what I should also say, because it's a continuous system, which maybe I didn't highlight quite as much, but we essentially, we have a reactor um, that's heating the, the solids with the carbon dioxide that always stays hot. It's not a batch process like for solid adsorbents where you have to heat and cool and, you know, that metal structure, you have to always put energy and, and find cooling. So so we have efficiencies that come from that as well as from the low temperature um, of the of the regeneration. Um, we, we think in that sense, it, it is one of the more energy efficient thermochemical appro approaches. Um, number wise, you know, we, we look at 2000 kilowatt hour per ton of CO2 um, in, in early stages of this process. And then we, we think it can be lower depending on what the guanidine amino acid combination is. So we focus a lot on what's that energy to get the CO2 molecule off the material. That's the only one that we cannot recover. Everything else can be recovered and optimized and engineered as much as possible. So um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and then regarding water, very quickly, um, I know this was a long answer, but I always want to explain where things come from. Uh, for water, yes, we do lose some water to the environment. Um, depending on the weather, uh, this water loss can be larger uh, or smaller. And uh, the reason we lose some water is that air comes in with a certain relative humidity and it will, we will leave the system with slightly higher relative humidity. Cold air, we know, holds much less water, um, so we can lose much less in that environment. Um, but the water loss is not is not a um, it's not a loss the same way it is for other chemical processes. We don't destroy water quality; it's just it's evaporated in the atmosphere. And and we think with also with very large systems, potentially that water stays, you know, it humidifies the air around. But then next time we do an absorption, it starts kind of wet, wetter or higher relative humidity than before. So. Um, yeah, this is something we're investigating, and obviously we need to build in different weather and sites to un fully understand it. And what what is the like, if you can share, what is the range of water consumption per ton? And I ask because you have you know you have folks like Abnos out there kind of talking about that they are they are you know generating water, and you know some of their backers kind of like deprecate other DAC processes because they use so much water. So I do, I do think it's an important um, thing to to you know be able to understand. 
Yeah, so we're looking at anywhere. So I would say water loss depends whether on the concentration or the type of amino acid we use and the temperature of the, that the process takes place. Um, so we're looking at maybe one ton of water per ton of CO2 all the way to four, depending on where we're located. And again, these are just preliminary um, results from the lab. So we will have to confirm and, and we have ways of um, understanding and minimizing that um, as we as we build bigger plants. Right. And I what I'll say about solid adsorbents is they do absorb a lot of water. Um, and I think what needs to be considered for those kinds of systems is that then this water travels through this through the through the actual process as well. So the quality and and you know having to making sure that that water then can be reused for other processes. So yeah. um, and you know I don't know what's better to humidify the environment or dehumidify the environment. I guess neither is ideal. But um, if we minimize impact overall, I think as an industry. <laughs> Uh, both both solutions have space, I would say. Yeah, and and the two kilowatt hours per ton rough estimate that you know could potentially be improved upon is that electricity only, not inclusive of your thermal requirement? Or are you are you rolling your thermal into that? And yeah, I understand so you have optionality on the thermal because it's low low heat. So you, there are different places besides electricity you could get a hundred degrees Celsius heat. Yeah, so that that's and that's why I I'm always I had I feel like I had to say a number I have to say a number but I always yeah. it's always like which what do we mean electricity and heat and also I think when it comes to heat is like what kind of quality of heat where does it come from um, that that is a cumulative it, 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 most of the energy requirement comes from the heating of the solid so it is mostly heat uh, we see waste heat at this uh, low temperatures of 100 degrees it is much cheaper than. Than electricity, so uh, you know we say two to three, uh, four times cheaper. Um, so, so when you were comparing one kilowatt of heat to one kilowatt of electricity, that's something to be considered the cost as well as what would have happened with this heat. So we're looking at integrating with systems where if we wouldn't take the heat away, they would have to cool. So essentially, it's not only it, you know then you look at the system efficiency of integration, then it can be much better than. Um, right, you're, you're saving cooling and you're using heat for a good thing, uh, director capture. So that that's a combined number. And is the embodied carbon in your? I always get confused whether it's a solvent, right? Like your amino acid and your guanidine. Is there like material embodied carbon in there from an LCA perspective, or is that kind of de minimis once you amortize it over a balance of plant scale? Yes. Yeah. So it's a sol. sol I guess it's a solvent sorbent system because we have a solid and a and a liquid. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so in terms of LCA, I think for most systems, including ours, and in, we have the, the LCA comes at scale from material use and energy um, use. So those those two drive the the LCA and it's the same for us. I think on the chemical um, front, uh, right, like we don't expect, again, the materials to be to the grade in the process. One advantage, which I forgot to mention, is that we don't heat amino acids, which are like amines. So I think a lot of people know if you heat amines, they degrade. We on purpose keep them separate from the heat and the guanidines can be heated. So we think a lot of savings come from that. Um, and uh, yes, we when we do LCAs, we look at how the materials were made, what were the inputs, and also what energy type we use and how much energy. So the, those are the two big drivers and the rest is steel. Got it. Um and in terms of it was, I thought your comments on modularity were interesting because everyone talks about modularity and, and your process is maybe not quite the same. In turn, it's modularity is not quite the same, although eventually you will have modules. Is it, is it the case that you kind of don't yet know what your modules will look like or um, or do you have an idea like, OK, at a megaton scale, our modules are going to be this. Or we're going to have X of each of the components. Because I think of a carbon engineering plant as like this large unitary thing, and you know other processes have these sort of you know, Lego like building blocks. Like how how do you see at scale Holocene working in that regard? Yeah, so I think the 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 discussion on modularity I also find it very interesting, and I think it's about how we define modules. So traditionally, modules were things that you could mass produce, right? So the whole idea was that you can manufacture, uh, you know, with robots something like over and over like a solar panel. And then that's that's truly modular. Um, you can you, the economies of scale or the cost reduction comes from just like robots mass producing the same thing. I find the concept difficult to apply as a chemical engineer to apply to DAC in the sense that we're we're all talking about kind of very small chemical plants or even for solid adsorbents. It's not it's not just a static piece of something that um, is inactive. 
uh, right? We always have um, heating and cooling and water going through. So, so the idea of modules in, in such a complicated, relatively complicated system versus a solar panel, I think is, is a little, it's borrowed, but it doesn't quite fit. So I'll, I'll just comment that. Um, and then in terms of how, how we're thinking of our, our modules is that, well, it's not that when we say we think we scale up in size, what that means, it doesn't mean every single time we build a bigger plant, we have a much bigger crystallizer and then a much bigger fan. At some point, we're going to hit the limit of the fan. We're going to hit the limit of the crystallizer. So in the next plant, we're going to have to do two crystallizers to double the capacity. So in that case, is modularity. And I would say that those numbers we understand relatively well. So we know what the biggest fan is. We know what the biggest crystallizer is. But the reason I still like to say we scale up in size is because for me, what interests me is also the system design, like how you pipe everything, how you move heat around, how you move even air around. Like if you have a lot of different fans pointing in different directions, I think this is something we don't talk about. Like you're, you're like blowing, you know, outlet air into inlet air. So I think like when I look at the system design, the way we think of our system is scale up in size. But yeah, this is maybe <laughs> musings on on modularity yeah. and, uh, and scale up. And it is kind of the incumbent chemical engine industry, petrochemical industry, sort of a guide on some of these things because you're using similar components? Yes, it is. So a lot of chemical engineering is, you know, uh, you a lot of the efficiency or as you scale up, you go from batch to continuous, which is also what we plan to do. Um, and you just, you know, you, you build bigger systems, which that means instead of having little, you know, like every time you have a module, right, like you're you're, if you have two modules, you have like the number of screws doubles and the number of like weldings and everything. So the idea is on a lot of chemical engineering, petrochemical, chemical industries, bigger things are often more efficient. So it's the same thinking. Um, cool. And switching gears a little bit. And last question for me, because we have some really great audience questions and uh, keep those rolling in, please. Um, can you just talk up for a couple of minutes about what it's like building a company in Tennessee? Um, you know, I, uh, on a couple different, it's an interesting place. I mean, politically, it's interesting and different from, I think, a lot of jurisdictions where um, CDR companies are forming and being built. Um, you have like a big, powerful incumbent, I guess, utility, the TVA. Um, it's not even beyond the utility, I guess. Like, can you talk a little bit about how you, that experience and, do you, and has it been a good place to build a company? What have been its like, you know, strengths and benefits? And like, are there any kind of challenges that you face? particularly in building a company in Tennessee? Yes, um, a lot to say here. So, and I'm I'm today in Nashville actually um, meeting with state legislators. So this just speaks to, it is a smaller community than I think the Bay Area, uh, especially around tech, right? uh, tech and, and climate tech. We are in a unique place, but I also think it's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunity for us here because it's kind of uncharted ground. So there's a lot of education we can do. There's a lot of support we're getting. Um, and maybe I'll say the reason I think Tennessee, why we moved from the Bay Area to, to Tennessee. So Oak Ridge was a big driving force. We thought, okay, well, the chemistry, the inventors were there, but also the talent that comes at National Labs, I think is, you know, so much, so much to learn. Um, and then also when, when you're thinking about building director capture plans, especially on the gigaton, that slide with all the, you know, how much mass we have to move for this whole industry, it was really hard to imagine doing this in an urban setting. And, um, you know, obviously we're in, in Knoxville, that is an urban setting, but we're much closer to brownfields, like there, there are plants that you see nearby. So it just feels a little closer to where we're going to build. Um, although ultimately we hope to build all over the U.S., uh, so so exciting, but it, I think that was one component. And I will say the the community here has been really, really, really supportive. I think it uh, went above and beyond our expectations. Uh, University of Tennessee um, offered us lab space that I think we got like you know two thousand oh, thousand five hundred square feet for the price we would have gotten in Palo Alto. So and and the equipment, the instruments, the access we have to professors, I guess, just it's been so uh, welcoming. Um, the, the TVA, true, a very important partner. They know, you know, they build assets, they have assets, they build plants, they're decommissioning coal plants, they have brownfields. So all of that is is in place. And I would say, you know, Tennessee um, does have advanced manufacturing. They do have battery manufacturing here. So they're not strangers to to climate and and building for these new industry for the new industry so i think we're tapping into that we're also tapping into trends uh people moving outside you know from out the coasts into inland united states so i think there's it's a unique time and place to, to be here yeah very cool well thank you for that and uh, you know the the 
power and capabilities of the national lab system is kind of a recurring theme in CDR. And I should have mentioned a Gritch up front. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, very cool. And um, let's, Mega, do you want to come on and ask some audience questions? Yeah, definitely. Um, so sorry, this is really dark. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, a few on the market and sort of value chain first. So first one is, what are your ideas about the value chain? So suppliers to provide building blocks that you need all the way through to system in integrators who are using the technology and kind of where do you see Holocene headed within that and the industry headed more broadly? Yep. Sure. So I think uh, value chain was focused on upstream. So for now, you know, I'll say our the materials, so the amino acids are are available at scale already there, you know, where for, for quite a while we will be buying um, from from suppliers amino acids because they already exist and they already, uh, there's no much better than us how to make them. On the guanidine side, that's different. Uh, the guanidines are special to us, to our process, and we continue innovating, tweaking the molecule until we get, it, you know, the kind of the biggest bang for our buck from it, so to say. And there we've been engaging with uh, contract manufacturers for, for, the, for the guanidine. So we developed the process, the synthesis. We know what has to be mixed with what. And we focus a lot on using precursors for the guanidines that already exist at scale. Uh, but then we hand off that production process to a contract manufacturer. They have the equipment, knowledge, safety in place to make the chemicals. And we're already able to make, um, you know, tens of kilograms of these materials. So I think that's a good sign that it can scale relatively quickly. Um, ultimately, you know, we might be making them in-house. I think that's maybe an ambition or a dream or it would make sense at some point, but not for the you know next couple of plans. And then I'll say on the downstream, maybe of the value chain, we we will partner with with CO two off takers, probably mostly sequestration, but we're also looking at utilization pathways. It would for me the LCA has to make sense because, right, we we want to remove carbon dioxide and we really want to have a, a big net impact on CO two concentration atmosphere and like in the atmosphere. And for that, you need a really good uh, application of the CO two so that the CO two stays in in the materials that you're putting in it into. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. And then kind of just thinking about customers. So, you know, you talked about the Stripe Frontier purchases, which is awesome that you've got that in place already. What are you thinking in terms of the next kind of cohort of customers? Is that government procurement, compliance, um, you know, oil and gas customers potentially? Um, yeah, where do you see that going? Yes, I think here we're uh, our conservative, maybe more conservative nature. So we're like, we want to build first, sell uh, later in a way. And I know that this industry is actually going a little bit in, in a different direction where you sell before you build. Uh, obviously, you know, we're, we're doing that with Frontier for the pilot. So I don't want to be, don't want to say that that's a bad strategy, but we, I think I'll say that we only want to sell things that we are quite confident we can build and we know how to build and we have funding to build, et cetera. So, so it's um, that's one thing that maybe we want to not to deviate too much or in time between those two things, building, uh, removing CO2 and actually selling it. Uh, that being said, we're looking at, you know, there's many applications out there that we are also participating in for for CDR, obviously the government will be a big, we think a big partner in removing um, carbon dioxide. So, so interested in that and engaging with corporates who have real and true net zero goals. So I, I would say that they're the only way we distinguish ourselves maybe, or the way we, we think of ourselves is like, yeah, this making sure we don't put the, um, yeah, that we, we don't get ahead of ourselves and we first build the technology before we, we go too aggressive on the sales. Yeah, and actually, we got a question about that as well. Just thinking, you know, you have for the pilot plant, which I think makes a lot of sense, being able to forward sell credits and fund some of that, um, which is super smart in the early days. Um, how did you think about getting that kind of confidence that, you know, you can actually deliver it um, at a scale that's maybe quite different from the lab scale and both in terms of like your own confidence, obviously, but then also providing that certainty to the buyers as well? Yeah, I think uh, I... <laughs> Uh, we have you know, Holocene has a unique answer here is we've done it before with a different technology at Climeworks. So I have seen what it personally seen firsthand what it goes, what it takes to go from grams in the lab to or making a new material for the first time in a beaker to to building Orca, uh, helping build Orca at Climeworks, which is 4,000 tons. So I feel like having seen that, that gives me personally a lot of confidence um, that we can do it. Obviously, different process, uh, different materials, different challenges along the way. I don't want to minimize any of that, but I think having being able to visualize the steps helps a lot, um, especially for, again, for us being a little more conservative. 
And then I think in general, the support, I, what I mentioned, so the funding that we've been able to get, the support engaging with external consultants too. So, you know, we we have a lot of engineering expertise in-house, but we always like to talk to people who have been in, you know, oil and gas for 30 years or so, you know, we show them our process, we show them our plans and, and we look for feedback. So I think that that's another kind of confidence boost or and reality check sometimes so that we get. So that I think that's what keeps us going. Okay, great. Um, and then, yeah, just a couple more before we go. So I know you talked a little bit about the LCA drivers, so the energy and other things that drive the LCA. Could you just talk about that on the cost side as well? Like, you know, key cost drivers, presumably energy, but anything else that is important for you? Yeah, I think we are working to understand the costs. So, you know, you know we have techno-economic uh, models in place that we use. We look at how, you know, crystallization scales in other processes, how air contactors scale. Um, we do have we we do have the kind of the not luxury, I don't know what to call it, but the uh, advantage that others have walked before us. I think carbon engineering, you know, have, they have looked a lot at liquid solvents. They've published a lot and we compare ourselves a lot uh, with with them in the sense that we want to, you know, we 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 give respect and kudos, but we also want to yeah. improvise and and uh, not, and, sorry, not improvise, but but innovate on top of um, of what they've been building. So that's something that um, is top of mind. And um, yeah, so so costs, obviously, equipment. The contactors will be, I think, on the capex side. That's you know, at the end of the day, if you look at really big plants, is it's a lot of contactors and the kind of the engine of the machine. So the, these other steps become kind of more compact and more efficient. Uh, we know that that that's going to happen with scale, and then energy uh, materials. Um, that those are the other two drivers for costs. Okay, cool. Um, I think that's about all we have time for. Um, but Anka, thank you so much. This has been really great and great to see you guys moving forward with all your next deploy deployments. Um, Toby, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, those were great. Thank you for those questions. Um, and thanks, Mega. Um, Anka, it was really great to see you. And um, thank you so much for, for spending your time with us today and for the great presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you for having us and uh, for everyone who stuck around until the end. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, and good luck with your meetings in Nashville, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen briefly, and um, uh, just a couple things coming up. Sorry, why this is not sharing. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a couple more. This is the CDRs coming up, and uh, can put that info in the chat. Um, so we actually don't have one next week, but in two weeks, we have uh, Ted Christie Miller and Teresa Hartman from B0 Carbon to talk about carbon ratings. Um, David Hughes from Plant Village to talk about distributed uh, biochar with uh, smallholder farmers in the global south. Um, Graphite, which is an innovative new bikers company, also funded by Breakthrough, um, coming up in a couple weeks. So some great episodes and we have a few more to announce. And uh, that's all we have for today. So thank you so much for being with us. Again, thank you to Anka for the amazing presentation and uh, see you, see everyone soon. Be well, and um, we'll see you in two weeks. Bye.